Therefore, it makes me wonder, um, there, there's, there's similarities, overlap, and important differences. And maybe it's just the issue of, uh, maybe it's the issue of um, relatively well compensated diastolic dysfunction, but the repercussions of the compensation is what get you. But your heart structure remains intact versus my situation with a cardiac, uh, cardiac dysfunction uh, basically um, advances and you begin to get uh, architectural changes and left ventricular dysfunction, which will lead to organ failure and death if not a transplant. So there's a, there's a big difference. And also the frequency of evolution in, to death in, in, the, in the true left ventricular dysfunction group of cardiomyopathics is pretty high, but not so uh, in the diastolic group, such as Anthony Demaria noted. The type ones, when he called back five years later, were all answering the phone. So it's not, it's not at all, it's, it doesn't evolve like it, it's, it's different. But that doesn't mean it's not important just because you don't die of it. And then more importantly than that, I want to say this also, I, it's, I truly believe there's hope, and I'll, I'll cite some of the evidence of that recently published of the way I think we're going to go to treat this effectively. And maybe just as I stand here before you with a cardiac output of 10 liters a minute, that of a 20-year-old man. By the way, when 50-odd-year-old men get 20-year-old hearts, all kinds of things <laughs> happen. My, my hair grew back. I got hair on my arm. And I started to feel like a 20-year-old man. So it's amazing. It's amazing what cardiac output will do. Uh, I also, just as an aside, discovered something phenomenal about cardiac output. When you get a transplant, they put you on immunosuppressive agents to suppress your immune system so that you will not reject your donor heart. And they warn you that because we're going to suppress your immune system, you're going to get infections and to wear a mask and don't go in theaters and by never stand in front of a bunch of people like this because you might catch something. Don't fly airplanes and such. Wash your hands every five minutes. <laughs> Uh, don't eat uncooked food. Um, all kinds of a list, a list of things they told me not to do as, as long as in my arm. And I was sort of shocked to find out that over time, none of this transpired. Indeed, I, I have had less infections and less problems than when I was, quote, normal. And it, it occurred to me, it just came out of, the, out of the blue, I just realized, what is more important, a good immune system in a test tube? or the ability to microcirculate it. What good is an immune system if it can't get to where it's supposed to go? So is the apparent immune dysfunction as it may manifest as infections after infections or yeast infections or this or that and the other, or problems with the Lyme agent or mycoplasma or chlamydia or the things that we all hear about, or the problems controlling herpes virus, to what extent does that have to do with the immune system itself? Or what does that have to do with the effect on immune integrity when you have an output 50% of normal? With a vasomotor system cranking down to maintain your blood pressure and making the microcirculation even worse. I mean, if you, you, know, you, you can't have an immune system if it doesn't go anywhere. And what I found, I went to my doctor and said, well, how come I haven't had all these infections? And he said, well, you're one of those people with 10 liters a minute. Normal is seven. You ended up with 10 liters a minute. And when you have 10 liters a minute, you cannot be immunosuppressed. It's impossible. It doesn't matter that you're taking immunosuppressive agents. Isn't that interesting? So I can walk around here taking immunosuppressive agents and be completely immunocompetent because I have 10 liters a minute. Wow. Every day, I, every time I visit, they have me open my mouth to see if I have yeast in there. <laughs> no, my mom said, well, there's no yeast. And I said, well, I didn't know there's no yeast in there. <laughs> he said, well, you, it's because of your output. I said, okay, he shrugs his shoulder and walks off. That's what he knows about immunology. <laughs> <clears throat> there, I mean, it's intriguing. Every time, every, at, at every point along the road, as I try to understand how does this syndrome, as I have known it, link back to this thing, it always does. There's almost no exception. 
These are some of the key scientific literature that's been published regarding phase one, so Dolmet, Kamoff, and Klimas, phase two, illness, McGregor, and Pimental. Phase three has a lot of people there, uh, but look at the last three, Peckerman, Drexler, and Paul, I think are the key, the key people to read in the medical literature today that have something important to say about cardiomyopathy and CFIDs. That would be, of course, uh, Peckerman. Drexler, how to treat it. I'll give you his data. And Paul, what's going on at the cellular level? Again, this phase one, uh, you'll notice the misery is high. The limits, however, are okay. But phase three, misery is significantly less, but limits are significantly more. That's a combination of cardiomyopathy and interestingly altered gene expression. Work done at the CDC by Susan Vernon has shown that when, as you evolve in this disease, the genes that you were born with do not express themselves as they once did. The expression frequency of genes is altered. Not the genes themselves. The genotype is the same as when you were born, but the phenotype is markedly deranged. And you might ask, why are my genes acting differently, the ones I was born with, than when I felt well? It's because your body is responding to the problem that you have, most especially your cardiomyopathy and its, and its organ by organ repercussions. In other words, most of the gene expression aberrations are not what's causing your problem. It is actually what is defending your problem. Makes it, it's, a, it's a leap to think that, think that way. Maybe less what's causing a problem and more how you're re reacting to it. That's what's causing the gene shifts. But nevertheless, when those gene shifts are made, you're stuck, genetically stuck in a rut. And if the problem went away, guess what? You may remain in the rut. And how do I know that? Because that's what happened to me. <clears throat> I, had, I went from about two liters or three liters a minute to 10 in about 45 minutes. And when I woke up from this, and they congratulated me of the success of the operation, and they guess what? You're the proud owner of a 10 liter per minute, 20 year old heart, and you're going to be, you, you sh this, this is great. And then I, I turned and I said, well, how come I don't feel great? <laughs> and the reason I didn't feel great is my genes didn't know that I had a 10 liter per minute heart. That took a solid year. So you can instantly change your output and it will take a year or more for your genes to evolve back to the normal physiologic phenotype. There'll be a lag time, which means that you can think about this for a minute. That means that what do you think then about treatment that within a short order of time makes you feel better? Not good. It's not good. Or it might be good in only this narrowest sense. You may be suffering from a compensatory mechanism against the deeper problem, and all you're doing with your therapy is suppressing of a compensatory problem. And you think because you feel better that you are better, and nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, you could be doing exactly the right thing and never know it unless you are conscious enough to realize that there could be a year delay. This is very problematic in the fundamental treatment of this disease. We're not, no longer am I, in necessarily in the business of treating your misery. I, I've decided what I'm going to do the rest of my life is treat your underlying problem and then do something unique to rapidly assist the body in phenotypic resolution to normal physiology. That is the way we're going to go. I learned that from my own experience. <coughs> you can't, to really to he healing at the, at, 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 the, at the genetic level doesn't occur quickly. Recovery trajectory does occur in this disease. We've all observed it as clinicians. Some people just get better and better and better. And some people stay pretty much the same and some people get worse and worse and worse. Very similar to the trajectory of, of cardiomyopathy in general, by the way, including my version of it. Probability of functional recovery, I didn't mean symptom recovery, but functional recovery to do things, go back to work, etc., is pretty high if you've had the disease 
less than two years, close to 90%, according to a Tahoe study, of the people who got sick in 1985, followed 10 years later, 90% were back to work. But um, as the years go by, the percent probability of recovery declines in a diminishing way. So the longer you've been ill, the less likely you will ever be functionally normal. That's just what the statistics say. But notice it never goes to zero. It never goes to zero. And if we could, if we could really get at the underlying issues, I, I'm very confident that we could restore these patients as much as I have been restored. If it's just a matter of output, why not? <coughs> but it will take a while. 